Ah, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining me. I am here tonight with Jen Lyons and Brian Naslin, and I am really, really excited about it. So, uh, Jen Lyons currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia, after having lived most of her life in Los Angeles, California. After self-identifying as an artist, graphic designer, and illustrator since she was a child, she has since become she has since come to the conclusion that while a picture may be worth a thousand words, she'd rather have the words. She has one husband, three cats, and a nearly infinite number of opinions on anything from feminism to the correct way to make a martini. She sometimes thinks that writing is her personal excuse for endless world building and an alibi for when the FBI wants to know why she's doing all this research, research on suitcase nuclear weapons and M-theory. She has an obsessive love of semiotics, mythology, occult mysticism, and science. So basically, in her own words, quote, I'm a geek and proud. Brian Nasland was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, where he never quite learned how to love crab cakes. As a technology-soaked millennial, his first taste of fantasy wasn't from Tolkien or any of the other amazing fantasy writers he now loves, but instead from watching his older brother play video games in the basement. After healthy doses of many Final Fantasy games during his formative years, he developed a lifelong obsession with flawed characters lugging swords around in the wilderness. Brian spent his early 20s living in Manhattan and subsisting off of ramen and cheap vodka, and now lives in Colorado. He still eats ramen, but traded the vodka for craft brewed IPAs. Brian is now a product director for a tech company and, the fir and first started writing about dragons to escape the crushing boredom of his incredibly long bus commute. When he's not writing, he's usually griping about video games on Twitter, hiking with his dog Lola, or whitewater kayaking in the mountains. The last activity makes his mother very nervous. Blood of an Exile is his debut novel and the first in the Dragons of Terra series. He's, he recently released a second novel in the series, Sorcery of a Queen. So... Thank you both so much for being with, here with me tonight. It is really, really exciting for me to get to talk to you. I am a huge fan. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yeah, and, thank you. I'm excited. And for the folks at home, um, in, in what is becoming a tradition, I guess, as we do these shows, um, there are drinks involved. So I have a, uh, a Nice Schoof, which is a Belgian dark beer with spices. And I'll kick it back over to our authors, and they'll tell you what they've got. Sure. I've got the um, Odell's Mercenary, which is a double IPA, um, and very delicious, and from a local brewery in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I have a martini, um, <laughs> a, a gin martini um, made with um, Orbium gin. Okay. And um, Very cool. I mean, yeah. I feel like gin, despite my warm vodka days when I was like 22, gin's the only hard alcohol that I can get behind now. And I do, I do like gin martinis and like grave diggers. That's a, like a cool mix drink that I have, but that's, yeah, gin's my one, my one hard alcohol poison. I'm very, very fond of gin, so. So I, I'm curious then, because you have strong opinions on the making of a martini, is, can you make a good martini with vodka? And I'm asking for myself because I, much like Brian, Gin is one of those things that I have tried. I've tried very hard to be into, and it hurts me in my soul. Well, the thing is, is that there's there's so many different kinds of gin out there that anytime somebody tells me that they don't like gin, I suspect they just haven't tried the right gin. But, um, you know, it's really difficult for me. I, you know, on the one hand, I, I'm a big proponent of people can do what they want <laughs> and and it is not really for me to say that um that you know if you want to have a, a a vodka martini that is that is totally fine on my personal opinion that's a kangaroo <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um but uh if somebody else wants to call that a martini more power to them i won't stop them okay so so strong opinions but welcoming of other opinions that's the way it should be um so Let's move for a moment off of alcohol. I'm sure we'll come back to it. We always <laughs> seem to. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the books. So first, um, your novels are both really unique in, in different ways, though. Um, so, Brian, I want to ask you first. You know, you've got a really interesting take on dragons. Um, for people who are not aware, uh, in Brian's novel... There is a whole world of dragons, with, and in fact, there's an appendix in the back which has where the dragons are, what their habitats are, what they do. Um, but 
you really approach it from the perspective of they are a part of the ecology and as a result they have a role to play um and i think that that's really you know shown very well with with the princess ashlyn character um who's worried about what killing all the dragons might mean so where did this idea come from what made you think of something so unique yeah, I think um, it, it's funny because it's sort of the the Ashland kind of conservation aspect came late in the process because um, I'd started sort of with the Dragon Slayer first. And in my world, the way it works is becoming a Dragon Slayer is a punishment usually for committing a crime. And it can happen to lords, but it can happen really to anyone. And you get a pair of tattoos and you have to spend the rest of your life <clears throat> um, basically trying to, trying to slay dragons, usually unsuccessfully. And so for that to work, for it to be like a realistic punishment you could give to a lot of people, I needed like a ton of dragons in the world. So that's why I started there, just sort of filling it with um, basically creatures to kill dragon slayers in very large amounts. And then, so um, the way the, the world is set up is there's some countries that really don't have good control over their wilderness at all. The dragons kind of rule and they're just kind of living in their backyards hoping they don't get eaten. And then other countries have pretty successfully eradicated their populations and they're starting to see degradations of their ecology there's wheat famines and plates and you know um whole things are sort of coming out of whack and that actually um i was inspired by a documentary about yellowstone that was about the uh, wolves in yellowstone and it's a real thing that happens in this world where if you remove an apex predator from um a system that system kind of falls apart mm -hmm. um and it happened with the wolves and i think in yellowstone I thought it was really interesting, but I wasn't sure. It's things where, you know, the, the riverbeds start to erode, and when, like, moose don't have any predators, they start scraping off the leaves and trees and things like that. So I thought that was really cool, but I wanted to spice it up a little bit. So I did things where, you know, in places where the dragons had been taken away, you know, there's sort of this hallucinogenic cactus that the monkeys start eating, and the monkeys go insane, and then that becomes just monkey territory, and humans can't go there because they've removed one predator, but things have gotten completely out of control somewhere else. So. Sure. Um, like, like a lot of things in my book, it was inspired by stuff I either like, you know, saw documentaries about or, or read books about um, or, you know, read on the Internet because I'm addicted to Wikipedia. And I wanted to kind of um, apply it to like a like a fantasy setting with with dragons. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's, you know, it almost is there's almost an element of uh, the the Australian like war with the ostriches. Right? It was either ostriches or emus where the farmers are trying yes. to get rid of them. Emus. Thank you. Where the farmers yeah. were trying to get rid of them, and they brought in the army, and they couldn't do it. And it turns out they ended up being a very important part of the ecology of the area. And I, I like the, I, I, I like the idea of systems that exist, and that when you tinker with them, it's sort of the Simpsons episode where they bring in, you know, there's the lizards that are hatching from the eggs, and they have to get rid of the lizards, so they get the monkeys, and then who's going to eat the monkeys? And they just, it's just, it's a system that keeps stacking on top of itself. Um, so mm -hmm. doing that with dragons, I think, is pretty great. Uh, but, but Jen, you have a very different take on dragons. You you don't have the the lexicon dragons. You've got the Godzilla of dragons. So talk to yeah, me a little bit about that. Yeah. So okay. So so first, I, I'm going to go back a little bit. So the series is called the Course of Dragons, and um, the first book is the Ruin of Kings. Uh, book two was the Name of All Things, and then book three just came out, and that is um, the Memory of Souls. Um, and dragons in my world are. Uh, absolutely the opposite of Brian's dragons. Um, dragons in my world are um, a corruption. They're they're a um, they're a defiling of the natural order. Uh, a curse that happened. Um, so dragons are wrong. <laughs> dragons are <laughs> dragons are um, not only uh, not only not part of the the not part of nature, but they actively disrupt nature wherever they go. Um, and then they're also so they're not they're not a biological creature the way that that Brian has them there's there's only nine mm -hmm. of them and it's it's not really sure it's not established at all if they are even capable of reproduction as dragons um, and and for the most part most of them are, are just completely insane um, <laughs> but they're also enormous <laughs> they're also yeah they're they're, they're kaiju sized creatures they're um they're really really big and and one of them just one of them could devastate an entire country so yeah it's a little bit different 
Okay. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because it almost feels like the dragons are the the people. You know, they're not they're they're influencing the environment, but not in a positive way. And you guys should know, uh, we've now sparked a debate in the live stream chat over whether or not uh, artificial intelligence could could actually improve upon nature because clearly human beings can't. Seems to be the consensus <laughs> that when human beings try to fix things, we do the exact opposite. And yet, uh, the can artificial intelligence do it? That's very interesting to see. Uh, so yeah, good. We're already we're already sparking a debate for change. That's a good thing, I think. Hopefully, yeah, it's an interesting question. I I don't. I'm not sure. I guess it depends on how good the artificial intelligence. Yeah, is. yeah the problem with the problem with any artificial intelligence is garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only as good as it's been programmed to be. So that's that's an issue. I'm I'm no. firmly on the side of human beings when the robot revolution comes. So yes, I I think that absolutely we should we should mistrust the AI. Um, but no, no, we're 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 online, man. The robot overlords can already hear us. No, I'm not uh, loyal to and I'm ready to go. This is, oh, for what? Welcome. This, this, this is the moment where we need to have the disclaimer, like when you're joking with your friend on a phone call, and you're like, "Look, to the FBI agent who's listening, I'm clearly yeah. kidding about the thing I just said." Exactly. Um, it's like like the the um, certain uh, certain household. Uh, smart apps whose ah, yes. names begin with A um, that I'm not going to say aloud because <laughs> trigger. Um, mm -hmm. But like, if you keep thinking, if you think her enough, she'll start like being nicer. It's it's really creepy. The one, the one that I find the creepiest, if I'm being honest, is I'll be having a conversation with a friend about something, and I'll go, I don't know, we should Google that, and I'll go to my phone and I'll start typing like, what is, and Google will finish the sentence for me, and I'm like. How did yeah. you know that I was thinking and talking with my friend about that device listening. that claims you don't listen? Yeah, they say they're not listening, but I think all all mics are hot mics in one form or another. Yeah, yeah they're listening. We know they are. So yeah. I am I'm building a Faraday cage in my basement though, so I'll be I'll be cordoned off before long, just getting ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> um so let's let's talk a little bit, Jen, about sort of the the structure of your first book. Um because at times it's almost epistolary, you know. It's it's a it's a recollection of the story, um, and also, and I I don't think that this is a spoiler necessarily, um, but also at times you question the reliability of the narrator. And I feel oh, like it's the most unreliable of narrators. Yeah. Right. <laughs> how was it, how how was it to write something like that? Because I imagine you know when you're writing a book, I'm trusting the narrator. He. He, she, they, they're my eyes into this world. And to then go, wait a minute, they may be totally wrong is a whole right. mind flip. Yeah, um, uh, which is why, you know, I mean, the, the guy who's who's pulling the notes together to, to form this book. So so there's a different word to describe what the book is. Mm -hmm. It's not a because okay. that would be letters. Yeah. Um, it's diegetic. Okay. And diegetic means that the entirety of the book exists within the realm of the book. Um, the book itself exists in the world I have created. So, so there's the idea is that there's is that I have actually been removed <laughs> from the uh, from the equation. There, there is in the world um, there is an author of the book, and it's not me. Um, so he's the guy who's who's footnoting everything, and he's the guy who's pointing out, um, oh, you know, this this point of view character just expressed this opinion and he's completely wrong. <laughs> this is, this is yeah. incorrect information he's giving you because the school systems today, <laughs> terrible. What are they teaching these kids? Um, but then of course, sometimes he is wrong too. And um, it was just fun. <laughs> it was just fun to create that, you know, yeah. to, to allow for that sort of, um, you know, there is no omniscient, um, all-knowing, factually correct person who is going to always have it right and um, not throw their biases in um, because that never happens anyway. Sure. So it, it's kind of nice to be able to label it and say, yeah, no, don't expect that this is untainted mm -hmm. by <laughs> agendas because, <laughs> you know, it never is. Yeah. No, it's. I, I think that there's something really... You know, my, my degree was in history, and so in reading primary sources, uh, one of the things that my the head of my department really drilled into us was the idea that the closest you will get to the truth 
are primary sources, except when they're not. And <laughs> I, I think that that's completely true because people do write with an agenda. People often write with an agenda without even meaning to because they look for things through their own, through the prejudice of their own eyes. So I think that there's something really cool about acknowledging that going in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and it, you know, it's a lot of fun and it allowed, you know, without spoilering anything, it allowed me to go back like in later books and have people yelling at the guy in the first book and being yeah. like, Hey, you got this, you said this thing. And this, this thing was bad scholarship on your part because you should have looked into this and you didn't, or you should have pointed out this was unreliable and you didn't. You took this at face value when clearly yeah. this should not have been taken at face value. Right, right. And, and, really cool, you know, huh? and you're you're a, you're a bad you're a bad scholar for doing so. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got our first uh, question from the live stream chat. It is, uh, I think an I think an outgrowth of the debate over whether AI could fix Yellowstone because <laughs> that's what that turned into. Um, but I will pose it to you. Uh, the question is. Could there be a sort of science fiction book where there are hackers trying to kill dragons made out of code? That's that's our first question we've got from the crowd tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That sounds like a cool idea for a book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like an awesome idea for a book. Somebody should write that. Yeah. So. Uh, um, no, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I, I'm pretty sure I've I've illustrated that. I mean, <laughs> I actually have. You know, it was it was it was this whole it was a magazine article and it was, you know, um, slaying, you know, it, it was a, on programming. But yeah. yeah, slaying, slaying a code dragon yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, I, I've I've written a lot of books that have not been published as yet. Mm -hmm. And um, not all of them are fantasy. There's there's science fiction in there as well. And I've somehow never managed to not put a dragon in. So <laughs> yeah, you, you should. Dragons are cool. I, you know, Exhibit A, books about dragons. Um, for what it's worth, that person has come back in. Uh, <laughs> they said, uh, I sign away any rights to that. I have to see this book. So, <laughs> clearly, if anyone is inspired by that idea and they go, I think I could write that, you should write that. Please, you have at least one person who's into what you're, what you're pitching. Um, well, you know, I was just going to say that um, this, this reminds me of a thing, and that is... Um, Ideas are not precious. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, if, if Brian and I took that idea and we each of us said, oh, yeah, we love it and we're going to create a book with it, our books would not resemble each other at all. I could just yeah, it's crazy. It. yeah, it's crazy how far a premise can can take you in one direction or another, uh, depending on who's, who's running. I will say, so I don't code at all, but I work with a lot of engineers and it's uninteresting work on in the real world so adding dragons to it is is always going to be a good idea because <laughs> it's it's uncommon for it to feel cool in the moment <laughs> um so we have another question uh this one is from alicia white and they say i love dragons so i want to know from both jen and brian what is what's the best thing about the dragons in your series i know that's tough right <laughs> <laughs> They're terrifying. Mm -hmm. I I love that about them. I, I love that they're not cuddly and you don't think you can befriend them. And um, they're they're horrible. Um, which I mean, you know, I I went into this with this very firm agenda that that I wanted to bring that awe back into how dragons get regarded because mm -hmm. there's so much and, and I love those books I love those books in which dragons are the things you ride and the things that you befriend and, and these you know close associated things but I kind of missed the stories where dragons were um, the things that would shake everything up because you couldn't handle them so okay. yeah it's, it's interesting um one of your, I mean, the the old man, um, the word that comes to mind when I think of that, and when I, when I read those pieces, is, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to horribly mispronounce it because I do every single time, so please correct me, uh, Bromdignagian, which okay. is from Gulliver's <laughs> Travels. All right. Okay, good. I'm, all right. So, yeah. um, yeah. in Gulliver's Travels, there is the island of Lilliput, where there are the very, very small people, and then uh, Bromdignag with the giants. 
And so right. it's entered in the English language. Bromdignagian is gigantic, cyclopean, huge. And so yeah. I think the old man, that's what I that's what I envision there. So I, I think you captured that. It is a terrifying thing. And he's not the largest of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I really wanted my dragons to be, um, uh, to be dragons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted them to be acts of God that, that, um, were scourges okay. on the land. I think I did a pretty good job of that. So. Yeah. I like that. You should, you should trademark that if you haven't already dragons of mass destruction. <laughs> that's, that's, a book title right there. that's, that's like an alternate history kind of book title. You know, the Americans harness their dragons first, and that's how they win the war. Um, Brian, what about you? How, what's what's your what, what's your thing there? Um, let's see, I guess, you know, we talked about how, you know, I, I put a lot of, like, thought and detail into the different species and types, and you talked about the appendix, and it, it's funny, so, you know, when I um, when I turn, like, the initial draft into my agents, like, I want to represent you, one thing you should do is, like, make an appendix of all the dragons that, are, that you mentioned in the book, and I think she meant for me to take, like, a few hours and give her back a few things, and I spent, like, three solid weeks on it, just pouring all the different, like, weird animal facts I picked up off of the internet and kind of, um, I really like birds and bird watching and kind of like picking a bird and like, all right, this dragon's going to be kind of like the blue jay. He's like the punk rock dude and, and sort of just, you know, okay. dumping way, way more time and effort into the thoughts of how these animals would behave in the real world. Um, which was a lot of fun, and I feel like yeah, when I turned the appendix into my agency, like, this is great, but like, how much time did you spend on this? This is like a lot more detailed and longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and then I had time on my hands. So. I thought a lot about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's important. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we've got two more questions um, so far in the live chat, and then I'm going to switch from live chat questions to talking a little bit more about the books, and then we'll come back to the live chat questions. I've got to you know, technically, I think my title in this is moderator, so I should probably moderate a little bit. Um, but, uh, so the first question, what are your thoughts um, as a sci-fi and fantasy author about... Oh, okay. What are your thoughts as a sci-fi slash fantasy author about the blending of sci-fi and fantasy? And that's to both of you, I think. Okay. You want to take this one first? I take the last one first. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I think it's awesome, and, um, like, the, um, sort of the one that comes to mind the most I've ever seen really enjoyed is Gideon the Ninth, which sort of does a, a blend with that kind of thing, and I think it's just fantastic, so I love it. I have, like, so I'm working on my third book now, and I can't be distracted because I'm on, like, you know, close deadlines, but after that I have, um, you know, an open door to what I want to do next, and I have this, you know, idea of all it gets longer and longer, and a lot of them do blend sci-fi and fantasy just because it opens up so many cool possibilities and I feel like I've only ever written fantasy stories or really bad literary fiction short stories so I've never gotten to put in a spaceship or like you know a laser blast or anything like that so mixing those two things together I think is just fantastic so I love stories that do that and I think I don't know if it I mean it seems no one has their finger on the pulse of what's like coming next or trending, but I hope that it trends more because I think it's so cool when I get to read it. Um, I think the dividing line between science fiction and fantasy can be very arbitrary. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of books out there that get classified as one or the other where, uh, but for the whims of fate and publishing, they, they could have easily appeared in the opposite category um, or have their feet firmly, um, you know, on the other foundation, even while they proclaim to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tend not to pay too much attention, quite honestly. Um, I, I love both. And that's probably why I tend to refer to, you know, SFF more than just fantasy or just science fiction mm -hmm. um because i i think it they're they're all they all fall within that that speculative um you know umbrella of uh we're gonna we're gonna break the rules of the world yeah. in interesting ways it's just you know do you do you do it with technology or do you do it with what you're calling magic mm -hmm. And I, I think I think you're a hundred percent right. And uh, everyone else seems to feel the same way. Uh, Alicia White, Dune is a classic sci-fi slash fantasy. I completely agree. 
Uh, Magpie Starcatcher, uh, in quotes, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. <laughs> Very much that way, I think, between those two. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the genre of, of fantasy. You know, I think most people would say that when it comes to a fantasy, there's a sliding scale when it comes to magic, between soft magic and hard magic. And I'm curious, where do you think Dragons of Terra and A Chorus of Dragons exists on this scale? Or, you know, if we really want to kind of throw the playbook out here, do you not even believe in that scale? You just go, no, it's magic. I don't, you know, I don't think about that. I think for me, I, I think you can certainly have that scale, but like, it depends on how you create things. So like a Brandon Sanderson book is on kind of like a hard, a hard magic scale. Talk and he, I think, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And I think that you can embrace it if you want, but there's no real need to define yourself that way. And for me, I feel like for my stuff, I've, I've had other people describe my magic system as it's not really a magic system at all. It's, it's, it's science. And mm -hmm. there's varying levels of understanding around the science. Um, but there isn't any real such thing as magic. And I feel like that's that's an okay characterization. The the one that I've heard in reference to a completely different book that I liked quite a bit was actually about, there was a podcast on uh, Geese Guide to the Galaxy, and they were doing an episode where they talked about the Expanse. And they were talking about how that's a sci-fi book that very much like adheres to the laws and rules of physics and space travel. And the vast majority of what happens can happen in the real world in theory, except for all things that are outside that scope are related to one kind of event that or element that's been introduced that as far as we know doesn't exist in our world i don't want to spoil the expanse for people <laughs> and for me i inadvertently like i heard this characterization it's kind of the same thing that i was doing i introduced dragons into the world and i try to keep everything else basically functioning in a way that is plausible with our kind of like laws and understanding of nature mm -hmm. and anything that happens that is outside of that is at least some way tied back into dragons and it's, can depend how that's done and there's you know sometimes it's very directly related and other times it's a little bit more uh complicated uh, i guess is what i would say mm -hmm. um but i try to all keep those if you want to call them magical or just they don't really belong in this world or happen in, in this world of ours there's there's some tie back to dragons and so that's what i try to do with with mine i don't know if that makes it hard or soft or what but that's i mean that's where i think I, it also depends on like I think it does depend on what you define hard and soft. Do you define hard as having rules? Because if so, then yeah, I guess it's a little harder. But, you know, to use Sanderson as your example, I mean, his isn't hard because there are rules. It's because there are literal... You could write a book at the end of each of his books, which is just, this is the magic. Um, and I don't think that... I, I don't know that there's, there's one way that really defines hard or soft. Um, so I think if you are defining it as, are there rules, then yeah, I, it, it's kind of a hard system. But I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of elemental kind of whimsy to it, if that makes any mm -hmm. sort of sense, that I feel like maybe makes it a little softer. I don't know. Uh, what about you, Jen? Where do you think, where do you lie? I know, well, that's question. Or easy. <laughs> Well, I mean, I um, I think that in in my particular case, um, I tend to run very hard. Um, in that there are there are absolutely rules to how it is all it all works, and um, things that I have uh, laid out ahead of time, and that's just my background with tabletop games. Mm -hmm. I think peeking in, <laughs> um, but. I've tried very hard to have those rules not necessarily be apparent um, to the main characters in, in the same way that there are um, physical rules uh, of the real world that um, for many, many centuries we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so they seemed magical or they seemed um, enigmatic or mysterious because we we didn't have nobody gave us a book and said here's <laughs> here's here's a you know a breakdown of yeah. how the rules work um so it's the same sort of thing there you know i mean i i've heard people say that like as you guys have both touched upon that if you um if your magic system is reproducible if your magic system is something that you can you can break down in a lab setting and and get 
the same result every single time, then congratulations, it's not really a magic system. It, <laughs> you've just changed the laws of physics in your universe. Right. And and that um, that that's actually kind of a core thing in my books is um, is the difference between the laws of physics in one universe versus the laws of physics in a different universe and how those clash. Um, you know, so yes and yes. I mean, yeah. I, I think if you're if you're looking at it um, just very superficially, you're going to think it's kind of a softer um, system, and it's not. But that's okay. Yeah. I'm 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 cool with people thinking that it's it's you know that they don't necessarily understand what the rules are. Yeah, and and I don't. I like I don't... what you said. Oh, sorry, you said it's so interesting about like you know people's the level of people's like knowledge of how systems work affects what you see as magic and science. Like if you don't know how an electric eel produces electricity that sounds like a pretty magical eel to me you know yeah. um and there's an explanation for it but if you don't know it and that sort of like that distinction gets um really boiled down to just understanding how things work or not and then you know kind of getting defined from there and i think that like first of all that's a great example because i'm you know i'm 31 i own a business i'm in and i'm using big air quotes here an adult <laughs> I don't know how an electric eel makes electricity. I have no clue. As far as I'm concerned, that is magic because you could give me any answer and I would go, yeah, okay, sure, that's where, that's where electricity right. comes from. Why, why not? Um, yeah. But I, I just so you know, um, the comment section is going crazy with the debate over uh, wyverns versus dragons. Uh, quote, <laughs> hashtag, dragons have four legs and two wings. So it's... It's getting a little, uh, getting a little intense in there. Um, so, uh, Jen, let me ask you. You know, I, I would imagine that when you write a character, the goal is to make the reader feel a certain way about a character. I, you know, I, and maybe I'm totally wrong because I've never written anything more than the stuff I wrote in college. Um, but I would think you'd go, okay, this is the hero. I want people to feel a certain way about them. This is the villain. I want people to feel a certain way about them. Um, but in the world, people are kind of gray, and I think that's transitioned into fiction as well. With all that in mind, and I'm going to horribly mispronounce the name, with the writing of Darzan Daman, was there supposed to be anything that we're going to look at with this person and go, oh, I like that, I can connect to that, that's a, that's a redeemable quality, or was it clearly just, nope, this is a person that exists, and you should feel how you feel about this person? I actually had somebody come up to me and say that, tell me that, and Darzan, Darzan Daman is 100% correct. Hey, um, <laughs> Say that, that Darzan was um, their favorite character, and I just stopped and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> because, um, you know, I, I really like the fact that I have um, a world that is full of gray characters that um, that have a wide spectrum of moralities yeah. and justifications for what they do, except for the ones that don't. <laughs> and, and Darzan, no, no, there's nothing <laughs> redeemable about Darzan. Okay, he's good. he's a trash person. Um, <laughs> you know, he's a he yeah. is a sadist and a narcissist and. And he is terrible, and yeah, no. So I, I, I feel weirdly better hearing you say that, because yes, all the other, not all, but most of the other characters are very gray. And I would read, I'd be like, I feel like I'm missing it, because this is an objectively horrible human being. <laughs> no, what he's just an objectively horrible human being. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Weirdly good. Weirdly. Um, so, talking about characters, Brian, um... You know, you wrote a book with arguably five point of view characters, and that's got to be really tough. How do you keep everyone feeling with their voice unique and different? How do you keep the story straight, looking at it from five very different points of view? What's how much more complicated did you make your process? I guess. Yeah, it's it, it's not easy, and to be honest, I didn't. I did it because of the time. I was really enjoying Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire the series, and I was really enjoying Driver Crombie's stuff, and he always does that, so I just did it too. I didn't, I didn't think it through. I was just like, well, I, I started the book from Jolin's perspective, who's this sort of boy alchemist, and he sees the hero, antihero, whatever, Bershad, and you sort of get 
introduced to Brashad through his eyes. And I found that to be very helpful, but knew I was going to then have a perspective from Brashad. But I didn't, I didn't think it through. I just sort of like sprawled it and introduced him because I, I sort of thought that's what you're supposed to do, to be honest. And it created a huge amount of heartache and, and effort. So when I, <laughs> I wrote it um, over the course of a long period of time, and then I started querying agents and you get tons of form rejections and every once in a while you'll get a rejection with a little bit of feedback and it's not change this and I'll look at it again. It's like, I'm not taking this, but um, one agent said, all your perspectives sound the same. So I went back and rewrote everyone's perspective except for um, Brashad's and it took a while and it, and it was almost nice for someone to say that and just be like, they all sound the same. Like you've got to give these people more like depth and, and give it through their lens. She didn't say that. She just said they all sound the same and I'm not taking it. But I was like, all right, I get what you mean. They do all sound the same. Everyone is like darkly sort of sarcastic and, you know, let's see if we can kind of um, improve it. So that, that was actually really fun and I didn't regret that part. The part that is difficult is managing time and travel distances mm. because it's these five perspectives that have to intertwine at certain times. And I remember like I do all of my distances in like leagues and strides and things like that. So I was like, how many like leagues do they have they gone and how can they get back where they need to be? And like as a personal note, I pride myself on always arriving more or less exactly on time when I said that I would be there. And I feel like that skill helped me, but I had to like figure out how big a country was in strides and leagues and then how far they'd gone and all that stuff just so it would plausibly like connect and probably nobody cares about it except for me but i was like no this will be right and it will be possible that they can all have moved around this this amount and this distance so i don't want to talk about how many hours i spent <laughs> messing with that but it was a lot it was more honestly i spent more time doing distances and like changing the plot so that everyone could be where they're supposed to be than i did rewriting every single perspective except for one so it was an undertaking so you I'm say nobody cares but that is not true oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that there's, is not true there there is you, so are, you will have readers that will track that absolutely <laughs> i uh, i remember first of all for what it's worth um behind behind you brian i can see three different maps so clearly distance mm -hmm. is something that's important um but, you know, I remember, uh, oh, God, what was that movie? Alan Rickman, um, Galaxy Quest, where it's like the mm -hmm. Star Trek sort of rip, and they're, they're at a convention, and these very, very intense, you know, fans of the show are trying to talk about the design of the engine and why would you build it this way, and the poor actor's like, I don't know, I just, I, wore, I came to the show, I wore the uniform, I did my thing. So absolutely, I guarantee you, there is a fan of yours somewhere who is tracking the leagues meticulously and going... Could you have gotten there in three days? Yeah, no, it seems reasonable. So you, your work is well regarded. Don't, you know. I hope so, yeah. If anyone does, they can email me. I'll share my maps that I drew. And I'm like, no, the, the, the math checks out. They can, they can be here. Or like, Garrett's a very fast walker, and that's how he got here this fast. <laughs> people people have sent me pictures, like, of, of with all of my books where they've posted, noted it, and, and they're going back and forth, <laughs> checking kind of, different things in the different books at the same time, so, y yeah. That's kind of feel really intimidating, though, because you're the creator, but, you know, we're all, you, you, we're all human beings, and you write a thing, and that's a good scene, and you move on, and someone goes, oh, but this scene with this scene, and you go, oh, yeah. No, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, Jenna. If I made a mistake, I don't. Yeah, Jen, I don't know if you have any. I have a mistake, and um, I have a donkey vomiting in the scene, and donkeys can't vomit. And it's funny because huh. I, I I get, you know, people, like, telling me that, like, on a fairly frequent basis. And I would say, like, you're right, I know. And it was a fairly, like, late edition that I put in. It was, like, during maybe first pass or at least during copy edits. And so I don't Google everything to see if it's possible, but I tried to. But that one kind of, like, slipped through at the end. I was like, damn, yeah, why don't you yeah. can donkeys vomit? Yeah. No. No. I mean, um, f fortunately, not that particular one. Uh, I, <laughs> although I do, in fact, have a thing, have a note in there that um, I, I have a, a horse god in my books that deliberately modified horses so that horses and, and equines in general, so they could vomit. Um, <laughs> so um, it's it's actually the reason why horses um, and donkeys too um, can die of colic. Is because they they can't vomit, they can't clear out their um, their intestinal tract if mm -hmm. something goes wrong. So, 
And it's funny because I knew that. I knew about colic and all of that, but I just uh, I just sort of put it through. And, and here I am. <laughs> are, are these the interesting things that you learn as a fantasy writer where you have to go, do donkeys vomit? How much hay can the horses really eat? How much How much fodder is, an, is a moving cavalry unit really going to need? That, that seems like a lot of work. I, I'm curious, did either of you put together... Uh, basically, you know, like a world Bible, like notes where you go, I know this is a thing, I'm going to write it down so I know I've got it, or was it all just kind of in your head? Oh, no, I have a wiki. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely have a wiki, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't try to keep it all in my head, because mm -hmm. that, that that, that's the path of pain. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I say I have notes, but they're not organized in a wiki. It's just a massive file in both, and it's not even in one place. Some of it's in Evernote, some of it's in Scrivener, some of it's just on my phone in random note apps. I'm not, I'm not an organized person, and it, it has caused me quite a bit of suffering. So yeah, I do try to write stuff like that, that down, and I will control find is my friend across all of my different notes and things like that, and I can usually oh, yeah. remember enough to like figure out what to search to find the answer, whether it's in like a previous book or if it's in some note that I have from God knows when. I would have a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Just have a breakdown. I, I'm not an organized person either. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I have to be a very organized person. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I have to put all of my notes in one place. Otherwise I will lose them. And, and then I will not have them again, and, and I will be sad, because I will have this vague yeah. memory that mm -hmm. I knew something. <laughs> then, like, I had this all figured out, and I don't know what it is now. Yeah. No, I, I, I lose things constantly that are important, and I'll be right. And I also do some by hand if I'm, like, at a bar and, like, kind of stuck, and all sort of, like, it helps to kind of, like, physically write something down. So I'll be, like, rifling through these pages of crap, trying to find the one note that I remember that I thought was, like, you know, critical to this kind of thing, but I'm wildly unorganized. And like Scrivener is a program that lets you kind of, you can, it lets you do a lot of things. But one thing it lets you do is color code kind of different scenes and sections and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really handy if you use your color coding consistently, but I don't. I just like decide that my color is going to mean something else nice. and I read like, <laughs> the whole thing's a mess. And it's funny because for my day job, I, I work in tech as a product manager. So I'm, I'm working with engineers who need things to be structured, they will just kill you. So that's the one place where I like do my best. <laughs> Is that your wiki? No, no, no. I'm just showing you that I too do physical notes. Ah, um, there you go. Yeah. yeah. But then they go in the wiki. <laughs> so uh, right, yeah, I need someone to like be there to tell me that this is getting out of control and you have to fix it. No one really does that with books, so the whole thing's a mess. It, it's funny though that we both have product manager backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's funny. funny. Mm -hmm. Um. So I've got, I'm going to switch it back to a couple of questions that have come from the live stream. Uh, yes, I am paying attention to all of you. I'm not ignoring you. Um, so this one is from Alicia. Another dragon-centric question. By the way, uh, if someone can tell me in the chat, where do we settle on the Wyvern versus dragon debate? <laughs> um, but another dragon-centric question. Which is your favorite dragon in books, TV, or film? Alicia, if it's okay with you, I'm going to expand on that a little bit and also say in mythology, because one of the really cool things about dragons is that they are prevalent in basically every myth. Like, they are there in, in China, they're in Japan, they are in parts of Africa, they are in parts of Europe, they're very different in Western Europe as opposed to Eastern Europe as opposed to the Mediterranean, so what's your answer, guys? Let's start with Jen this time. Don't, don't make me choose amongst my children. <laughs> that's that's not <laughs> that's not cool <laughs> um i mean i i really really love dragons and so it would be very very difficult for me to go that's that's the best one because it, it just depends I'll tell you if what, i'm gonna be top three. the favorite the favorite okay. it's gonna be tiamat Ooh, mesopotamian i like it's it. gonna be tiamat yeah <laughs> absolutely gonna be tiamat but the OG, like right? Yeah, the OG, yeah. But <laughs> you know, there's so many. There's so many. I love I love um I love the Tarask. Um in part I love the Tarask because it's so obviously not a dragon. <laughs> and yet it is somehow a dragon. 
What's, what's the Tarask? I don't know that one. The the Tarask, uh, I think, is is French, um, and it's it's a it's a French mythology, uh, French mythological dragon that showed up in the Middle Ages, and um, you know, uh, it's associated with a particular town, and and it gets there's this whole story about it, and it's a turtle. It's a giant <laughs> slow turtle, <laughs> and, but but everybody's like, no, that's a dragon. It's actually a dragon. Okay. okay, you guys say so. It's a dragon. Yeah. Yeah, depending on what side you take on the tour, ongoing social media debate over what's a dragon and what's not, pretty much anything is a dragon if you want to uh, talk yourself into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I know how I feel about Again, it's like the martini thing. I know how I feel about it, mm -hmm. but uh -huh. I am never going to tell a writer that they can't call something a dragon if they want to call it a dragon <laughs> you are you are all you are you are both much more permissive than than the group chat right now the live stream because they are very clearly are defining what is a dragon what is a wyvern yeah. what is a serpent because there apparently are rules to these things there yeah, are I'm... rules to these things and i probably agree with them okay, okay. I, I probably agree with them but i am not going to be the guy that tells george r, r. martin that those are <laughs> dragons okay <laughs> yeah i think to... i yeah, I'll admit, I'm very dragon fluid. I'm, I'm, I'm not really that of me. Any serious loss here. That's the hashtag we'll have come out of this event. Um, come dragon check out fluid. the interview with Brian Naslin and Jen Lyons. Hashtag dragon fluid. That'll be, that's the, that's the key piece right there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have a tour article on, is, is Godzilla a dragon? <laughs> well... It's, you know, it's funny you should ask that um, because that is one of the questions: Is Godzilla a dragon? Um, and the debate, just so you know, uh, one of the, the the responses that was framed was that no, he is not because Japan has dragons and Godzilla is unique and different from that. Sure, sure, and I think, but I think it is more nuanced than that. Unfortunately, <laughs> okay. um, I, I think it is. Oh, by the way, I say hello to Ozymandias. That is uh, Ozymandias. Hello, Ozymandias. Um, <laughs> um, you know, because it it uh, it depends on definitions of dragons. It depends on who gets to decide. Certainly, Godzilla. Um, you know, Gojira as a Japanese entity, very different from Japanese dragons. Um, the social aspects of what Godzilla has become to a more Western audience, I think you can compare that to why dragons became popular and what we get out of dragons and make some pretty strong comparisons. Mm. Um, you know, uh, topologically, is, is Godzilla a dragon? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, is is Godzilla a dragon from a from a socio cultural perspective? Maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, and I do feel like you know kaiju have their own kind of category, and I guess it's one of those things like, can a kaiju also be a dragon? I I don't know. Who's to say? It's, it's a great buzzword. Though. <laughs> kaiju. I, you know, it's funny. I remember when um, for me the first time I ever heard the word kaiju was it uh, was watching Pacific Rim, and going, what a great word for that. And now it's become part of the lexicon of, you know, monsters, where we go, oh, that's a kaiju. And we all immediately yeah. know what you mean. We're like, yep, no, mm -hmm. kaiju, I got it. Um, <laughs> so, Brian, uh, this next question is going to be for you. Uh, I'm going to move off of our live stream. I'll come back to it again. I'm just trying to balance everybody out. Um, let's talk about Bershad, who I feel like we've been, I'm not ignoring, but ignoring a little bit. And maybe he'd like that, if I'm being honest. I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> he just kind of wants to do his thing. He's left alone. He knows what he knows how his story ends. You know, he's a, he's a grumpy dude. So <laughs> exactly. Um, but let's talk about his his something that makes him a little unique. Um, so for people who may have tuned in a little late, um, in Bershad's world, if you commit a grievous enough crime, like for example, trying to kill a king, you might be sentenced to death. But you'll be turned into a dragon slayer. And the idea is that you will go and wander the lands and kill dragons until eventually one kills you. Um, and it's not usually a terribly long sentence because, you know, dragons. But Bershad is really good at his job. And he has survived a long time. And part of it is because he has a very unique ability. Um, he has... How did you put it, Brian? A a, a, a Wolverine-like healing factor, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's some nuances to it, but more or less, I wanted to see if what Wolverine would do if he was a dragon slayer. That was kind of one of the one of the initial yeah. thoughts I had. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, talk to me a little bit, if you can, about sort of where that idea came from and how slash why it fits into this world. Yeah, I think the reason I started there was just because I like Wolverine and Deadpool were always my favorite of my favorite comic book characters growing up and I just think the healing factors are are cool for like lack of a better explanation and if you're realistically going to be killing a lot of dragons there needs to be some kind of like leg up that you have so I kind of started there first and really enjoy that aspect but kind of like I was saying before like I do want the more magical supernatural whatever you want to call them elements in my story to have you know either an explanation and an explanation that ties back into um dragons in some form or another so i feel like yeah it's hard to give any kind of specifics without accidentally giving too too many spoilers for either the first or the second book but what that wound up doing which was a lot of fun is coming up with this very sort of um uh, like layered relationship between Brashad and the dragons that he's been killing and that that kind of evolves as, as the series goes on and you see some of it in Blood of an Exile but one of the things that I really liked about Sorcery of the Queen the sequel was that I got to dig um, a lot deeper on that and and have like a very kind of um, uh, close relationship between Brashad and dragons and then that kind of thing so yeah that's a vague answer because i feel like if i go into i'll i'll, I'll mess it up spoilers yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> that's that's fine um I, I try to keep our our events as spoiler light ish as i can um because i want everyone to have the uh, the i want everyone to have the reveal i think that's a lot of fun it's a great payoff and i want people to have that so i don't want to take it away from anyone um <laughs> So, Jen, let's talk, if we can, a little bit about cosmology. So, one of the key elements is, and again, I hope I'm not spoiling, and if I am, you know, just shut me down real quick, and I'll, I will I can move on. Uh, but, <laughs> one of the key elements in your books is past lives. In particular, arguably, eight past lives. When you built this the cosmology of this world, where did you draw inspiration from? How did you come up with it? Because it's one of those really great designs that feels different and foreign, but at the same time very accessible. You know what I mean? Um, this was born of uh, a very, very way too many years of Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this was born of um, what would a society really be like when you can resurrect the dead? Mm -hmm. um, what does that do to a society? You know, when, when you can be reincarnated, when you can be resurrected, and who controls that? Mm -hmm. And how is that not, how is that not a, um, a control of a valuable resource that would, you know, a, an accumulation of power that would have an effect on things. Mm -hmm. And of course the answer is it's not, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is an accumulation of power. It yeah. is absolutely, um, you know, if, if this is a thing that the rich have and the poor do not, um, then, then that's an issue. Um, and and all of this, the, the idea of the twin worlds that you have a, that you have a very real, world and the living world and then you have an afterlife and that these are actually concrete places that you can journey between mm -hmm. came out of me trying to examine what the ramifications are of a thing that is treated very trivially in in most D&D &D games mm -hmm. which is this idea that death is temporary <laughs> yeah kind of an inconvenience but not really a big <laughs> deal you know you can get raised um there, there'll be, you know, you can make a petition at the local temple and pay a fee, and, and you'll you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of where that came from. Very yeah. cool. And and as sort of a an add on tag on to that, um, one of the other themes, and I or themes isn't the right word. One of the other important things in in your books, and again, I'm trying to be spoiler 
light. I, I don't say spoiler free. It's like when someone tells me it's a fat free candy. I'm like, well, then it's neither not fat free or not candy. Don't lie to me <laughs> with your don't no chicanery here. So, spoiler light. There are magical artifacts, for lack of a better word, in your world. Um, does do the numbers? Is there significance with the numbers? The number of magical artifacts in comparison to the specific reincarnations. Yeah, the number eight is really important in right? my world. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> It's it's yeah no that's not a coincidence at all um, that that's a thing that um, in fact um, uh, things off of that four eight sixteen you know the, those those all of those things that that's very um, that's a thing you keep coming up because I've I've always you know numbers and magic systems in the real world um, tend to be very specific although we we use a different you know, it's different numbers that are important in, in the real world. We tend to, you know, 7 and 13, and, and it's different numbers. But um, we tend to like, uh, we tend to like uh, prime numbers a little bit more. Um, so when I was creating a different universe, I was like, okay, let's create different magical numbers. Let's create different numbers that are important um, and, and kind of very fundamentally important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the whole, this whole story really stems from a, <laughs> a mistake in math because, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the ritual that goes wrong that kind of sparks everything is, is somebody not understanding what numbers are important, <laughs> getting the numbers wrong. Copy so, line of code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Which making a mistake common. on a line of code, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and all of this, all of this stems from somebody not double checking their work. Um, <laughs> so, um, QA did not do their job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and when, is so, it a bug or is it a feature? And yeah. It was. Hmm. And yeah, in this in this case, it's a bug. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so, um, yeah. No, that's a great answer. And, and for what it's worth, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a giant role-playing game nerd. Um, you could not tell that because I try and have a somewhat-ish professional air when I do these. Behind me, I've got a number of, like, lovely sign and rare first editions. But by and large, this bookshelf is outweighed by my role-playing game bookshelf, which is over there. Um, and I found it very interesting that in Dungeons and Dragons, um, I, I probably could go grab the AD&D spell book, but, eh. um, the name spells, like so-and-so's fireball, like Vecna's, um, oh god, it's like a necromancy thing, Vecna's something, those are all based on the eight, um, mages that were actual mm -hmm. player characters back in the early 80s that became... Yeah, for Greyhawk. Exa for Greyhawk, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so there's a really cool element to that. At least I thought I was picking up when I was reading it, so it's cool to hear that that's something that's in your life as well. So I'm like, oh, yay, I, I got that reference right. Um, yeah, yeah. No, my husband and I were actually just talking about that the other day, that, that um, the the really interesting ramifications of the world. This is probably a discussion for a different thing because I could ramble on about it, but um, what it meant for the world building to to tie so much magic to specific people. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, just that uh, in the case of Vecna, how, um, how amusing it was that Gary Gygax managed to, because, you know, Vecna is just a... Um, an anagram of, of Jack Van, of Vance yep. from, from Jack Vance um, because so much of D and D is cribbed off of Jan Jack Vance's work. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it, but isn't that a cool name? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Didn't yeah. that end up as the most cool name? Um, I think of how many authors I know who do do that. who will just take a word and just scramble it. Um, really it worked for Vecna. Yeah. It makes them pretty cool a lot of the time, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it worked. That totally worked. Vecna's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a we've got a quote from um, from the live stream here, and, and we've got a couple questions from them as well. Uh, quote from Brandon: Level four parties, uh, intense planning sessions to avoid casualties. Level ten parties. So the wizard runs in, point blank, fireballs everything to death. Then we go in, res him, and loot. Yeah, <laughs> that is how that tends to go at a certain point. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we've got a question as well uh, from our live stream. The question is, 
for both of you, uh, for people who aren't familiar with your work, what would you like new readers to know about your books slash characters slash worlds? Nice and complicated, very open-ended for you. Oh my, the whole the whole on the fly elevator pitch type of thing. Exactly. Um, yeah. You thought you were done just because the book was published. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, no, that doesn't that doesn't mean you're done at all. Yeah, um, I mean, I think for for my stuff, you know, we talked a lot about like you know the detail world about the dragons, but but generally, I tried to tell not necessarily a simple story, but a pretty fast moving story with some interesting characters and and focus on on that on, on characters and how they're interacting with each other and learning about each other and um, not necessarily like get you in and get you out and then it's over before you feel like it started, but you know, have a, a story that moves, moves pretty quickly. Um, and there's both pretty unhappy parts. There's a section that I cry every time I reread it and I only like do it during edits. So I'm doing first best edits, trying to look for typos and we think like a baby in public. And then also some stuff that's pretty funny and, you know, kind of sarcastic and humorous. So a pretty big, big mix of emotions. Okay. It's a good element. Um, I, I dig it. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I've I've noticed that people tend to either really love my books or really hate my books, um, <laughs> and it, it tends to be it tends to depend on how they feel about um, complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want a really straightforward um, story, my books are not for you because um, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's definitely a lot going on, um, but at the same time i think at the heart of my stories it's about people mm -hmm. and it's about relationships and um the uh the mistakes that we make in communicating with people that we love so uh, you know i think it tackles themes that are not um difficult to understand at all it's just that um people lie to each other <laughs> you know um and and people will lie to each other even if they love them mm. you know uh, even if they care about them a great deal uh and then i think i think it also is important to know that i um i do actually like happy endings <laughs> so <laughs> okay i i do so so um you know uh everything's gonna work out Prom promises <laughs> Um, promises, promises. I've, I've got another question from the live stream. Uh, this one is for you, Jen. Um, <clears throat> one, this is from Robert. One reason I gave the Ruin of Kings a listen to, I'm assuming from the audiobook, is mm -hmm. Vicus Adams. I'm assuming I'm saying that right. As the narrator, mm -hmm. was he your choice? Um, well, they presented me with a with a. I basically, um, they had a bunch of people audition for me, is what it amounts to. Yeah, oh, they they sent me a bunch of recordings. Like, you get to listen to them and say, yeah, yes, that yeah, one, and no, say, he's yay, just the name no, wrong. Yay, no. And so I, I did choose all the narrators for for the books. And um, he's great. I love him. Um, he, he's just been he's just been amazing to work with. So, um, so yeah. Um, that was actually, yeah, I found that to be, I didn't know that that was going to happen, you know, where you kind of, they do like tryouts and you get to hear a few audio samples, but I'm curious for me, and there, there was a number of them and I remember like listening to the first couple and be like, all right, that one's, I like that one better than that one, I like that one better than that one, I was sort of like, I don't know, like a little bit on the fence and then the, um, Stephen Brand, who's the guy that I went with, as soon as he started, I was like, oh no, this is the guy, this is the one who's going to do it. Like, was it hard for you to, to pick or did you like kind of just, once you heard it, you know it? Um, you know, it was like, sometimes, but sometimes it wasn't, you know, sometimes it wasn't mm -hmm. at all. So I, I have actually, like the first book has three narrators, mm -hmm. um, because there's three different POVs. Um, the, the second book has a different three narrators. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had then, a lot of tryouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then book three goes back to two of the guys from book one. Um, but, uh, you know they were they were just it, everybody's been so good <laughs> so yeah. um yeah it hasn't it has it's been just a pleasure 
Well, we, we've got a question, and more of a comment, but it leads to, I think, a really great question here uh, in, in our live stream. Uh, so they said, Alicia says, I had no idea they had auditions for these things. And I guess intellectually I did, because obviously, you know, you have to try out for the job. And it makes sense that they would have you be the person who'd be deciding. What are the kinds of things that you're looking for when you, when you, when you listen to this? What, so, you know, Brian, for you, what were the three things? You're like, man, I, I really need them to be able to do these three things. Yeah, I think for me, and so with, the way my process worked is that there was sort of, um, they read a kind of a sample of the first chapter, which covered kind of two main character pieces of dialogue, including Bershaw's, and then just sort of the general feel of how it would go. And for me, it was really the, um, Stephen Brand just nailed Bershaw's voice, um, and he was going to be a big part of it, you know, obviously, since he's the you know the main character and yeah. his, his voice needed to be kind of right line. So I, I was kind of just... Um, I think I was giving myself a lot of criteria and stuff, and then as soon as I heard his portrayal of it, I was like, oh, no, we're good. This is, this is the guy. He's, he's got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting for, you know, so for Ruin of Kings, um, there's three different POV characters, and those POV characters, um, particularly in the case of, of Talon and Kieran, are actually doing all of the other voices in character in the book. You know, they're, they're actually telling a story. And so they're, they really are, you know, <laughs> they're saying those words. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really just important to me that they, that they nail those prime voices. You know, Talon had to sound like Talon and mm -hmm. Karen had to sound like Kieran. Um, you know, uh, Thurbishar had to sound like Thurbishar. Sure. Um, and, and I mean, so that was kind of the main thing was, um, you know, I, I wanted them to be able to do other voices as well, but to some extent that was much less important because no matter what happened, it was always going to be Kieran trying to do another voice, mm -hmm. not, not, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. not a voice actor doing another voice. So, you know, it, it was kind of okay to me if, if he didn't maybe do the, if Kieran didn't do the best you know, um, to race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although, in point of fact, Vickis does a fantastic to race. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so Robert, who sort of kicked us off on this a little bit, says, um, "Love Thurvishar. He's such a pack of sass." Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, so, let me ask you both then. Um, you know, these are these are series that we're talking about, and. Um, the most recent book in each of your series has recently come out. What are what are some questions? You don't have to give us the answers, but what are some questions that are potentially getting answered in your latest book? And what are some new questions that might come out or might come about? I know, right? That's a, that's a horrible one. It's like you don't want to give it away. You want to tease yeah. enough. It's so, the spoiler, the spoiler threading of the line, but yeah. So I think, I think, and I have to emphasize this, it's five books. Yep. This okay. is book, this is book three. We're not done yet. We're not done. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a, there was a lot of people who were coming back to me and going like, D -d -d -w -w how dare you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is not the, this is not the end. <laughs> yeah, right. at, the, at, the, at the last, like, you know, page, it be like book three or five. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, please believe there will be more books after this. It's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> so, but no, uh, I, I think book three is really when um, the consequences of book one and two start to come together. So, so book three is really when we start, <laughs> it's when shit gets real, you know, yeah. it's when you're starting to go, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> when misunderstanding so, the math and misunderstanding a prophecy become really <laughs> important. Really, so the memory really, leak and the bugs are really stacking up. And it's yeah, really, really, really stacking up. And it's also when, um, that thing I mentioned earlier of, you know, maybe Thurbishar getting some of the details wrong or some of the assumptions wrong and not questioning them in book one mm -hmm. start to come back to bite him in book three, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, oh, you you did have the pieces to put that together, but you you took some things at face value that maybe you shouldn't have. And so book three is when that really starts to come as a, a wake-up call that, that maybe, you know... Um, 
I, you know, it was it was a it was a thing with one of um, one of my editors actually who came to me at one point and was like, "Well, so and so is one of the good guys," and I was like, "I, I never told you <laughs> that we only had good guys and bad guys. <laughs> I, I never told you there were only two sides. That's that's not how these work. Um, who told you that that was a good guy?" <laughs> So, I think that really starts to to slam home in book three. And uh, and and Brian, how about you? What are some things that again, same question? Are are there new questions that are raised? Are there questions that get an answer of sorts? And I realize it is spoilerish. This is the this is the extra whipping cream in the cakes that we sell. That we go, oh no, no, they're very very healthy for you. <laughs> you know, ignore the frosting. Yeah, no, yeah, I can I can ride that line, or I can try to. Um, so yeah, so my, mine is a trilogy, just three books, just just three books, which is minor <laughs> change. But um, so I think there's 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 a few pieces. One, um, the world does expand, and in, in the sense that you get to see new countries, new places that you heard about in, in book one, um, but didn't didn't actually get to see, and that was a lot of fun to do. And then I think that there is this mystery around Bershad and how he is healing and how the, his body works in relationship to the environment. That question, I can say that that gets definitively answered in the second book. Okay. Um, and then I think the other piece that I really enjoyed that's new is that I, you know, I've, I'm in this place where, you know, I wanted to look at kind of the, the how dragons would impact in ecology and there's sort of that side of things. But, um, there's also this mad scientist who exists really in only a few scenes in the first book who becomes a much bigger player in the second book. And I got to do a lot of fun things with, um, with him. I mean, fun is a weird word cause he's pretty crazy overall. Um, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's fun for like, us. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> yeah. The things that he does, I shouldn't define as fun, but it was, it was, inter it was interesting to do him. And, um, I get into, you know, if, if I'm sort of doing um, trophic cascades and the impact of taking away a apex predator from an environment in book one and book two, I got into um, cordyceps fungus, which is, I think it's like pretty well known now because it's the one that um, takes over ants' brains and makes them kind yeah. of like move out of the colony and that kind of thing. So I, so I ran with that a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, overall, I think that it's... Um, you know, I think that book two is when things expand, and then book three is when they contract again to kind of the big apex, you know, okay. point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, has has sort of become tradition on our shows, especially when, you know, I'm allowed to have a beer or two. Um, <laughs> I tell everyone, oh, it's like 45 minutes to an hour, and then like an hour and 15 in, I'm like, oh my god, guys, I have to let these people go. So here's the deal. If you are in the live stream and you have a question and you've been holding on to it, waiting for the right moment, this is your moment. Put the questions in the stream. I'm going to ask two, maybe three questions, and then I'm going to get back to you, and we're going to go through yours kind of real quick and make sure everyone gets their opportunity. And I don't keep these people here for, I think our record is an hour and 53 minutes, so we're not going to do that because it is a Thursday. <laughs> we're, not okay. <laughs> we're not going for the record today. And, I mean, yeah, if you guys well, want to, fun. I'm down for it. But yeah. it's, it's, your, it's your time, so um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about sort of the fantasy genre while our live stream sort of puts themselves together and gets some questions ready. Um, as a lover of the fantasy genre, and I am, I mean, I came up with David Eddings and the Bulgariad, uh, David Gemmel and his Drenai series and the Regante series, um... There's a lot of Davids, as I sort of think, as I say that out loud. But still, I, I love those guys, and I love reading fantasy, and it really bums me out sometimes that a lot of the more... So what I'm looking for here that's a nicer way to put this. Um, there are a lot they should of, have known a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, there are a lot of people who are sort of liter literary critics, let's call it, who look down their nose at the fantasy genre. And why? And, and their argument is always, well, it, it's fantasy where anything can happen, so there's no drama and there are no stakes. But you've both written books that are full of drama and full of stakes. How, how, well, first of all, I guess two parts. The first part is, why is this still a, a thing that gets kind of thrown at the feet of fantasy, whereas, you know, 
Jason Bourne can have amnesia but also still know how to be a spy somehow, and that's totally <laughs> believable and okay. And how, as a genre, you know, how do we how do we engage people better? I guess you know we're not all Tolkien, and that's that's a good thing. You know what I mean? Well, I think for me, it's funny because I'm. I guess in some ways, I didn't think of it until you sort of put the question that way. I'm a, I'm a converted person who was sort I was an English major. I had my nose off to fantasy for a while and was reading like, you know, dead white dudes basically. Mm. And <laughs> what, what really changed my perspective is that um, between my junior and senior year of college, when I was like deep into like the arrogance of only an English major who's like between his junior and senior year, um, I had a job at a literary agency as an intern. So I was reading submissions basically and I was kind of like passing things up to to um, assistants and then to agents and the agency I worked for um, they represented Twilight and they, they were deep into genre both like you know romance fantasy sci-fi all across the board and what changed it for me is that I was doing these dumb literary critiques of these short stories stuff like that for school and then I would do these readings and I would like something and bring it up to an agent and they would address it in the exact not in the exact same way, not like a literary critique, but they would be like, do you feel something when these characters are interacting with each other? Like, are you emotional about this? Is it, you know, making you see something about yourself inside these stories? And there's really no, there's no reason that a literary fiction story or a romance novel or a fantasy novel can't bring all those things from you. So if you look at it from like that side of things, which is the way that I, I like to, it's, it's character driven and like, do you feel something while you're reading it? none is any better than the other ones. It's about whether it can like drum up emotion in you. And once I saw these like extremely smart, talented people looking at, it was like a Dungeons and Dragons book that they were asking me about this, but like, do you care about the characters? Like if one of them dies, are you going to be pissed off or you're not going to care? I was like, oh, I'm going to be super pissed off if this guy dies. Like, okay, so give me the whole manuscript and we're going to read it for any of the good book. Um, Cause that's like what makes a good story. Um, so once someone told me that, I was like, oh, I've been being a little bit of a close-minded idiot, so. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't use those such strong language. But, you know, okay. Just for me. Just for me. That's the way that I felt. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, that even purely aside from the idea of appreciate a good story for a good story, mm -hmm. um, that, that fantasy has the same uh, potential to it to uh, examine... Um, social issues and um, and and social cultural development that we typically um, relegate to science fiction and technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at the works of of people like uh, N.K. Jemisin or um, uh, I mean Octavia Butler, obviously is 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 very famous for this, but but. More recently, P. Jelly Clark, and and just I, I could keep going on with names because I really feel like we are in a golden age right now, mm -hmm. where there is amazing, amazing work that is coming out all the time, <laughs> um, just <laughs> constantly. Um, you know, there is there is so much about fantasy that gives these wonderful opportunities to examine the human condition in a way that um, is not is maybe not as threatening um you know is maybe not as uh you know um is a little more accessible than um if it was purely a real world equivalent of it mm -hmm. um and i think that uh those are opportunities that we i, I don't know i feel like that have been ignored because we're just so um, interested in putting a label on it that is escapist. Yeah. Um, so, although there is nothing wrong with escapist. Yeah, we'll um, the window. Just, you know, now's a good time for it. Just right. Get you know, um, there was a period of time in my life where fantasy books really kept me going mm -hmm. um, in, in a very real way. And, and that I... Yeah, they, they kept me going. So yeah. so there's nothing wrong with escapism. No. Um, I think especially now, you know, uh, a little vacation in a different world is uh, is something everyone could use a little bit of, for sure. <laughs> I, think, I think you're completely right, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, you know. It, for me, it's interesting. Um, in my early, mid-teens, you know, I, I was kind of a jerk of a teenager, um, and... 
I was in a very, very rough time in my life. And for me, a teenager. Yeah, no, but like, you know, I, I did a, I did a wilderness program for about four months. I, I learned to live in the woods. It was an experience. Okay. Um, and then I went to a boarding school, and I like to joke that there are two reasons you go to boarding school. You're either really, really, really smart, and you go into an Ivy League, and you're, you've got straight A's, or you're kind of an asshole. And I never had straight A's, so that tells you what you need to know. Um, but I, I discovered at the public library in North Brookfield, Massachusetts, uh, David Gemmel. And his fantasies were all about like standing up against impossible odds. He wrote a lot of low fantasy, but with a hot, one high fantasy character who would just go, I know this is stupid, but this is wrong, this is right, and we're going to do what's right. And absolutely, you know, it, it saved me in a lot of ways. So I think that it's, any story can, can do that for someone, and I think it's wonderful that they can, and to be dismissive of them really, you know, bothers me. I think it was Neil Gaiman who said something to the effect of, um, fairy tales are important, not because they show us that dragons exist, because they, but because they show us that dragons can be beaten. And I think that that's something that fantasy can do incredibly well. Um, yeah, no, no, I would agree. I would very much agree. So that yeah. was my TED Talk. Thank you all for coming to that about why fantasy is important and you shouldn't be a literary <laughs> genre snob, let's call it. Um, but we have a couple of questions from the live stream. I promised I would get to you. So I'm getting to you now, and uh, if I don't, if, 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 I'm, if I'm answering questions and you keep asking, we'll, we'll roll for a little bit. So, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Christopher Morgan, who's your favorite tour editor? Answer correctly. <laughs> My favorite editor is uh, Chris Morgan. <laughs> is it? Oh, huh, okay. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Do, do not worry. My edits are going extremely well. I am on track and on time. <laughs> <laughs> why Why would you make me choose? <laughs> is, this, is this the equivalent of meeting your teacher at, like, the grocery store? Like, the night before a paper's due, and you're like, I'm definitely working on that thing. I'm, I'm there. It's getting real good. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as much as I do love Chris, I gotta say that Davy Ply and Bella Pagan. <laughs> I do need to give a shout out to Bella too, who's my UK editor. So I'm quite required to do well. <laughs> All right. Um, but Chris is, Chris is my OG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robert says, uh, quotes, that's a nice literary career you have there. Be a shame if something happened to it. I don't know that it's quite that mafia, but I like the, I like the thinking. Um, all right, so this next question is from Sarah. What is your favorite childhood book? Okay, okay. So, so the dragon so, question you go first. You go first. Find your childhood so, for us. So I was probably four. I was probably four. I might have been three, but I think I was four, and I got this um, this illustrated. Snow White um, from the local library and I didn't realize that you had to actually give those things back and we were moving around a lot so <laughs> I'm afraid I I'm afraid I stole from oh, no. the library. <laughs> but but the thing that you need to know the thing that you need to know is that this particular version of Snow White was beautifully illustrated and it was one of those versions of Snow White so it was one of the versions where um, all the violence was left in and the evil queen was, you know, sentenced to dance in um, burning red hot shoes at the end. <laughs> and w were there nails in the feet? Isn't that one of them? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Wait, did, the, did the birds attack the stepsisters? No, that's Cinderella. Cinderella um, is where the birds can peck their eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's Cinderella. Yep. Cinderella. Um, and I loved that book. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that is also all you need to know about me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, I'm actually, I do not know what this book is called, and I have tried to find it and failed, so this can be like a mini crowdsource if anyone recognizes it, but it was like, there were two characters, I think that they were bears, and one had a jetpack and one had rocket boots, and my brother and I would always pretend that, I think that I wanted the rocket boots, but he was older, so he got the rocket boots, we were playing around, and I got the jetpack, and in retrospect, I think like the rocket boots. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, we can't, you know, you gotta stick with the canon of the story. Yeah. Uh, 
but I think that, yeah, that was my favorite, like, little um, kind of, like, picture book growing up. And then my favorite book when I was, like, the first book that I remember really enjoying was actually Jurassic Park. And I feel like I had my dad read and explain certain parts of it to me. And I was, like, way in over my head, but I would, like, read it and get confused and then ask him. And he would sort of, like, explain it, read along. And so that was my first, like, co-reading experience that I re- remember very well. Beyond wow, the Jetpack. Right, right, right. No, that that's uh, that's pretty advanced stuff, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like how I learned about like how like sex work because there's you know in Jurassic Park they talk about like alligator sex and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I'm just learning stuff that I didn't realize <laughs> that I was going to learn about today. It's going to be such a fun conversation to have as a parent when your kids like, what's alligator sex like? And you're like, all right, let me. Do this. Um, here's the deal. When one alligator loves another alligator enough. Um, and I don't have a clear memory of my father, like, if taking the book to my father and be like, I don't understand this passage, but maybe I blocked it out because that's sort of dramatic to just get, <laughs> get dropped on you. Um, so, for what it's worth, no one in the live stream so far knows that book, but they've all decided that it's a book they need in their lives. Um, it sounds and- awesome, right? And I either had, like, a fever dream for, like, ages four to seven, but we, like, read it every day, and I loved it so much, and, like, it seems like a thing you should Google, like, Jetpack, Rocket Boots, Kids Book, Bears, and it will come up, and it's... As far as I know, it doesn't. Although now, watch someone is googling that and they're about to send me the title. Maybe, um, maybe it's from the timeline where it's Berenstein, not Bernstein, or Bernstein, not Berenstein. Uh, the Mandela. Effect. There we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for what it's worth, if you are googling at home, keep in mind that uh, Google uses MSQL Boolean for as a search engine. So as a result, disambiguated terms. Avoid things like the, of, and a. Just go with bears, jetpacks, book, children's. You'll probably find it. Um, the next question I've got from the live stream is, hey, look at that, from Ash, uh, for Jen, how difficult was it to query with footnotes and the different timelines? It's a good question. Um, well, uh, so that was the 42nd query I'd sent out. <laughs> that was the one that finally worked. Um... You know, I, I didn't get a lot of notes back, so I don't necessarily know why people rejected it or didn't reject it. Um, I just know that uh, I, I, I certainly had a lot of beta readers come back to me and would be like, you know, have you thought about, like, splitting the two timelines into two different books? And I'd be like... No. <laughs> so I didn't consider it, and the answer That's not... Well. I considered it and dismissed it. Mm. Um, <laughs> well, because what they didn't know, what they didn't know was that the original version, the very, very first version, was chronologically all in order. Mm-hmm. That, that I actually didn't do a back and forth. It was just, you know, Kieran from start to finish. And um, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely hated it. So... Okay. Um, so so I was not going back to that. There was there was no way. Um but once I hit my agent Sam, Sam Morgan, um he he never questioned. He never questioned why this needed to be in there. Not once. So he got it. <laughs> so I I um I think that uh I mean that's what you want, right? Is you you want somebody who gets what you're trying to do and, and yeah. supports it. That, um, that makes sense. I mean, I've never written anything, but yes, I would want someone who would understand. I, I wouldn't want to like have to explain. No, this is the villain. Don't like this. Per- I want them to get my story. Yeah, yeah. No, I never had to explain to him what I was trying to do. He was just like footnotes. Yes, <laughs> this is the best. Um, so, so that worked out. Cool. Yeah, I think that's just a cool feeling early on, you know, when someone gets what you're, you know, they're picking up what you're putting down. And Chris, if you're still around, I remember, like, you know, immediately, he was like, all right, he, he's got it. He, he sees what I'm going after. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's a really cool feeling. For what's worth, Chris is definitely still still around. He is our most recent commenter in the live stream. Uh, they're now arguing. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, he asked, is, is this just creepy pasta, Brian? It might be. Just something that, you know, came up. Um, so this next question is from Brandon, and Brandon wants to know, do either of you have a favorite role-playing game system? For what it is worth, and I, I, you know, minor plug for my, my buddy who's, who's asking this question, 
Brandon is currently running the game that I am in. Uh, ah, so, ah. yes. Yeah, so, he's running an Exalted game for us. I don't know if you know that one. It's okay. a white wolf system. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what is your uh, favorite role-playing game system? So, I can go first because my answer is sad. So, I've never... Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I've never gotten to play D&D &D or anything, you know, kind of like tabletop RPG or anything like that. And I've tried for years to invite myself into, um, you know, parties when I hear about them, but no one wants to really train the new person or anything like that and teach them. Aww. But right before all the COVID stuff happened, I finally, like, you know, found a group and there was, like, a new DM and he wanted to teach us all. I was super excited. We made all our character sheets. And, like, the day we were going to meet was pretty much when, like, lockdown started and all of that. Oh. We've, we've, we've basically been on bus. And I feel like there's lots of ways to do it remotely, and we should, like, get on board with that. But we Brian, you and I uh, need to talk. Uh, hold on, hold yeah, on, hold I've... on. There is now, by the way, Brian, there is a queue, okay, just so you know. Uh, the very first person, before Jen jumped in, was Brandon, who said, we can work in, Brian. We can, we can add you. And then yeah, Christopher no, I... Morgan wanted to add Skyrim Counts. So... Okay, if there's like video if video <laughs> games count, then I've got a longer list of things that I've done, but um, I've never done yeah, like you know, yeah. like a D and D or anything like that. You gotta yeah. know, Brian. As soon as you're in a group of people who play role playing games, you're like, I've never done, but I want to. Everyone's like, Really? <laughs> Would you like to be in my game? We've got thirty players. <laughs> see, fine. Okay, see this is over. exciting for me because I, I have I have I'm an introverted guy who like does not invite themselves to things, but I have invited myself to be like, Hey, I heard you guys are playing D and D. Can I come? I don't know any of the rules, but I'll like do my best. And they're like, No, you can't come. Um, we have our other <laughs> I, I sort of get it. You have your campaign. You don't want some guy who doesn't understand what the fuck's going on. Like, I, I'm not angry at them. I'm just sad for myself. I'm angry at them. <laughs> I'm angry at them too. That's rude. You invite people to games. That's how it works. Yes. Yes. That's how that works. We take the new so, yeah. player and we go, okay, you're a rogue. What do you do? D disarm traps and steal shit. That's what you do. Just go forth and do that. It's great. That's part of the fun. That, so, I mean, you're, you're speaking my language. I'm getting misty. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> so, so you have to understand that um, that uh, my husband and I, we, we have an entire wall, floor-to-ceiling, Billy Ikea tap cabinets just filled with role-playing games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, we've, I think, I don't even want to. No, no, I'm not going to talk about how collect how many years we've collectively been playing. Ooh, it's a okay. lot. Um, it's a lot. Uh, both of us, both of us have been playing since we were single digits. So, um, nice. yeah. <laughs> um, so I've played a lot of stuff, and he's played a lot of stuff. Uh, but my favorite is still, and and I'm in a I'm in a um, a D and D five point uh, game right now, mm -hmm. um, as well as in a, a traveler game. Um, but, uh, I got to go back to champions for me, um, which is a, uh, it was hero system. Uh, I mean, it's still around, but, uh, it's, it's basically superheroes and, um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a point by superhero system that, um, that I played for years. Um, it's, it's actually how I met my first husband. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, and and I still I still adore it. So um, yeah, uh, that would that would be, yeah, that would be my answer. That that is a great answer. Um, and uh, Brandon just had a great comment. There's a whole discussion going on right now in the live stream over whether or not you can ruin a game. How do people ruin things? And Brandon's comment is uh, the only time you can actually screw things up is if you intentionally wreck the experience for others. I think it's totally accurate. So Brian. Uh, Whose ever game you find, enjoy it. Just go and play. It's it's a lot of fun, especially right now. Um, no, and it sounds like an enormous amount of fun, and a lot of my life has been um, wanting to, to experience it. <laughs> Brian, when Different. we're done here, I'm going to invite you to the game, just so you know. Like now, I'm like, well, all right, like I'll get Brian in, and like we'll do this thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but different different people want different things out of a absolutely. tabletop RPG experience, and a lot of the challenge mm -hmm. of it is just finding is making sure that what your your table mates want is compatible with what you want. So yeah, it sounds like it's like most things when you find like a good group and a good group dynamic, it's like the same as any good group and dynamic anywhere in the world is you know both hard to find and, and just colossal fun. So yeah. yeah. It's, it really can be collaborative storytelling, and that can be really fun and also 
you know, can be tough if people have different agendas. I think Jen really nailed it there. Um, mm -hmm. So the last question I've got from the live stream, I think, is, is a great one, and I'm going to steal it, and I may just use it as my ending question um, for all all of the live streams that we do because it's, it's a great one you know right now the world is incredibly stressful no matter how you want to cut it um, we're all tense we're all a little freaked what can what are you guys reading that is calming or what have you read that's been a great calming thing for you okay my answer again is going to be a little bit weird because I'm not sure that everyone would have the same experience but mm -hmm. The book, This Is How You Lose the Time War, I found extremely comforting, and I read it for the first time as all this stuff was kind of, like, going down, and then um, I read it again a few times, actually, yeah. since then, it's not particularly long, and I think the reason I find it comforting is because it's about time travel, and it's, it's this beautiful kind of, like, love story about these two kind of time-traveling agents who are moving through these, like, braids of time, and it made me feel small in a good way. Yeah. Like there, you know, all these different possibilities and things that can be ruined and destroyed in the midst that there can be this, like this hope and this, and this love. So I, I found great comfort in that book and, and, and love it a lot. That's a great book. Um, I love that book. I blurbed that book. It was my holiday staff pick before NPR made it a thing. Mm -hmm. And not like, I, I realize this sounds like super gatekeepery. It's a great book. Everyone should read it. It's a lot of fun. And if you if you enjoy funny puns about seals, whether they be wax or animal, you know <laughs> exactly really what I mean. Good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Jen, what about you? Well, I'm going to be honest here. Um, you know, people, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, how this is everything that is um, the, the, the dumpster fire of the world uh, yeah. impacting productivity as a writer and um and it, it definitely has but what it has really impacted for me is reading mm -hmm. um it's it's been incredibly difficult to make me read anything um and uh so i have this giant tbr pile that is um being basically neglected yeah uh which is i mean it is what it is um, certainly, uh, you know, it's like that picture of the one guy who's ignoring his girlfriend to look at the other girl down the street, yep, um, except, that. except I'm ignoring all of the books that I should be reading and I'm reading fan fiction. Oh, that's good, though. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's a fair answer, though, is, like, to find comfort, just, like, fan fiction the stuff you love. Like, I, and I, I love fan fiction generally, so I think that's, you know. So, so that, of course, segues into a conversation, or into a question I have to ask, because I adore fan fiction. Um, I will be totally honest. I feel like my fan fiction loves are kind of basic. Um, I love Harry Ginny fan fiction. I will read them basically all day, every day. What are some fan fictions that you guys... And you don't have to give me specific ones. If you want to, if you want to like tell me, Drew, you should be reading this one, I'll check it out. But what are some like general... Like I like this story's fan fiction. I like this pairing fan fiction. What are you guys into? The ones that come out for me, Skyrim fan fiction I think is really good um, because it's already such a sandbox that people can just come up with these really interesting stories and... Um, and find Final Fantasy fan fiction, I think, is awesome, too. Like, and no, well, I shouldn't say no one in particular, but, like, from Final Fantasy VIII backwards, I like a lot of the fan fiction. <laughs> I've been reading nine, Chinese... Nine, too, sorry. Final Fantasy IX fan fiction is pretty good, too. <laughs> I've been reading Chinese fantasy fan, fan fiction. Ooh, have you... Yeah. Have you checked out... Um, he is, I mean, he's Chinese-American, but have you checked out Ken Liu's Grace of Kings? And the Dandelion I, Dynasty. I have, I have, yeah. Um, but uh, but so I, I've been, I've been hanging, I've been reading a lot of like uh, Untamed fan fiction Ooh. and a lot of um, um, the the same authors' other works fan fiction. Um, and just there's, you know, there's this, there's this huge. Um, I mean, just it's it's very interesting in comparison to. Um, to, to Western fantasy because there's these these uh, translated works that I mean often are um, you know five hundred thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, I mean they're just they're giant giant books, and everyone just seems to think that that's that's normal, which I mean I guess it is. Yeah. Um, 
that uh, that are getting translated into English kind of as acts of love um, because nobody's paying them for it. Um, and and it's really interesting. It's really interesting to read um, how how a different culture is establishing its own tropes that are not Western tropes at all, that, that are completely unique to them culturally. And, um, and that has been fascinating reading. So uh, it's interesting. I've got two. I've got I've got two Chris comments and one question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try my best to get everyone in here. And you know we're now at it, it's eight forty. It's been an hour and forty minutes, everyone. Oh yeah, man, we're coming up on the record. We're coming up, yeah. A lot, but okay, we're gonna try. We're gonna try not to do this. Um, all right. So from Christopher Morgan, for transparency, I wrote uh, M I N C. Oh, Minch, uh, fanfic back in high school for B G I I. Okay, um, and then uh, Christopher Morgan had a question. Wait, Jen, did you know of the Tor Untamed Cult? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like, please, yes. <laughs> we we all we all bow to sect leader Roushi. Okay. Okay. Um, and then this next question is from Alicia. Um, and ooh, all right. This this is a good one. This this ties into not just being a writer and artist, but also a writer business person. How do you feel about fan fiction based on your own works? This is to the both of you. <clears throat> ooh. Okay, so it, as far as I know, there is no fan fiction of my stuff. Um, but if there was, I, I I'm cool with it. I think that I actually benefit a lot from writing kind of fan fiction in the existing world. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's great. I think that, and I, I also see, I think that um, other writers have opinions about both kind of like, you know, copyright infringement or, or um, intellectual property. And I think that those are, are valid in some cases. Um, but at the same time, I think that I, I, I got a lot of value out of being able to skip the like establishment part to just to kind of get my feet out into writing. Because when you first start out, everything is hard. Getting a guy from outside the city to inside the city is a difficult thing to do. So having like crutches, I, I found to be very valuable. Um, in terms of like it being distributed and sold and money and profits, that's much more complicated. But as a thing to do to better yourself as a writer and practice, I think it's fantastic. So, um much like Brian, as far as I know, there's no there's no fan fiction mm -hmm. of my work out there. Um, if there was, uh, I can't read it um, for legal reasons. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I totally support it. You know, I, I think that uh, fan fiction fan fiction exists to fill a very valid need. Um, to to explore things that the original work cannot explore for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I completely support anyone's desire to to write fiction, fan fiction of whatever it is they want to write it about. Um, I just can't un personally read fan fiction based off of my own work. Sure, sure. <laughs> And, and obviously, look, it, it, it's a it's a somewhat tough question, isn't the right word, but it, it's a little bit of a tough question because obviously, you know, you want to be supportive of people doing, of, of people appreciating your works and going and wanting to put their own spin on it, but there's also the legal business side of it where you can't, to your point, you can't read them. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was going to say, I've got one last question. I've got two last questions. One last from the live stream and one last from me. Um, so, last from the live stream, from Brandon. Ooh, have either of you considered having your settings turned into an RPG setting? Um, I have, I'm certainly open to the idea. Um, it, it potentially gets a little bit complicated because, um, there is a question of who has the rights to certain things um, that it is definitely a thing that if anybody approached me and I would be open to that, um, I would then have to go talk to lawyers about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, given my background, I'm totally like, I would be thrilled. Mm -hmm. I would be absolutely thrilled. 
Yeah. Even though I've never played a tabletop or RPG game, I would yeah. be thrilled too. But yeah. As, as if yet, uh, yeah, no one's, no one's for that. That's going kind to of change thing. so quickly. Like literally, when we <laughs> call, Jen and I are both going to be pitching you going, no, Brian, look, here's what's great about my game. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, Normally, if it was a normal situation, I'd say like I only got time for one game, but it turns out I got time on my hands. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Okay. So, uh, it is, so we're six minutes away from the from the uh, the record. Or actually, I think yep. nine minutes, but still. Last question, and and we might get there because it's kind of it can be a doozy of a question. Um, once upon a time, in a critic in a creative writing course that I took back at New England College or maybe Michigan State, they kind of blend together at a certain point. Early in my collegiate career, I remember reading about the idea of the ideal reader. That when an author writes a book. They are writing it in mind with this ideal reader. And this is the person who reads the book and goes, Oh my God, this book was written for me. It fits me. Who, not necessarily like you go Kevin. I mean, if you know Kevin's your ideal reader, great. I guess name Kevin. But who is your ideal reader? What is what kind of What kind of reader is your ideal reader for your books? I write for me. Okay, yeah. I mean, I... I write for me. That that's a very, I guess that's not a long a long winded answer at all. <laughs> um, but um, I, I've always done this because there were um, there were things in fantasy books that I wasn't finding, so I, I had to write them. Um, you know, the, the quote the, the Toni Morrison quote. But um, you know, my my ultimately I write what I like and what I think is cool. And um, not everyone's going to agree with me, but hopefully people will, or enough people will. <laughs> yeah, no, I am pretty much just going to echo that because I feel like you can, everyone's a black box, right? Like you can't really write for anyone besides yourself. You can, you can guess and you can be a good guesser, but generally speaking, I only kind of know what I like. So I just hope that there are people who like the same thing that I like and kind of go from there. <laughs> You know, I'll even go so far as to say I think that that trying to write for somebody else besides yourself is a trap. Mm, okay. You know, like I, I think that if you are constantly thinking to yourself, okay, I'm going to write this because this is what the public wants, mm. that that will show in your work with a lack of passion and a lack of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think if you're if you're kind of coming into it with disingenuous um, motives. You know, not that you feel passionately about a thing, but you think that somebody else will feel passionately about a thing, that that will show in your work. Yeah, so. I think that, that's very true. And I feel like I, I'll definitely, I, I rewrite more than I like should, but it's not because I'm trying to like go after some other kind of like reader. It's more because I'm like, well, this was cool, but I can make it cooler. And like, this is a better idea. And I think it'll be more fun. Mm -hmm. And if you don't trust that, I mean, some people certainly can kind of like run out and grab the different people, but I just don't think that I'm one of them. Um, so I pretty much just try to make myself happy. Yeah. So, very cool. So, you're, so what both of you are telling me is that, um, okay, what was his name? My English professor was wrong. There is no ideal reader. Write for yourself. I like it. I like any time I can write a college professor and go, you were wrong. You made me write this <laughs> stupid paper and you were just wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, all right. Well, everyone, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, if you'll allow me and indulge me for a moment, I'm going to shamelessly plug. Um, so if you are interested in the books that we've talked about tonight, if you go, oh, my God, I like Brian Nasen's idea about, like, dragon conservation. That sounds cool. Or if you go, no. Jen Lyons, I love dragons just being the destructive, chthonic force of, of awful. I love that. You can get their books with me at Town Book Center. We are located in Pennsylvania. We're in Collegeville, right outside of Philadelphia. If you are not in the area and you go, gosh, I'd like their books and I want to support this local bookstore, you can buy from us online at townbc.com. That's T-O-W-N as in Nike, E as in Echo, B as in Bravo, C as in Charlie, dot com. And we do have, um, we have coming, uh, signed book plates, and we're going to have some signed books as well for you. So if that's something you're interested in, we've got you taken care of there as well. Again, thank you both so much for coming on with me tonight. I, I hope you guys had fun. I had a lot of fun. 
Uh, it, it's been it's been a good almost two hours now. <laughs> yeah, had a lot awesome. of fun. Tons of fun, and thanks for everyone who uh, who was listening. This is awesome. Yeah, um, definitely. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in, and uh, I think we're going to see you guys next week. Have a good one.